2 Peter chapter 3, as we slowly creep through these few verses in chapter 3, we will be looking at verses 3 and 4, uh, the first section of, of uh, these false teachers and their characteristics that are described by Peter himself. Uh, I saw a bumper sticker, and we all see bumper stickers on the road. We like to read bumper stickers. We're at stoplights, and we, we look, and look at the bumper, and we read the little bumper stickers or the, the license plates, and they make words up with the license plates, and so forth. I find them uh, sometimes very amusing. I saw a bumper sticker years ago that said this, God said it. I believe it, and that settles it. How many have seen that bumper sticker? No? A few. God said it, that, I believe it, and that settles it, right? That's a pretty clear bumper sticker. I'd like to change one thing if I could, though. I'd like to remove myself out of the equation. I would have written, God said it, that settles it. You see, I don't have to believe it. We don't have to believe it. The world doesn't have to believe it. If God said it, that's settled. God said it. Uh, He doesn't need anyone's approval of his word. He doesn't need to prove to anyone that his word is alive and powerful, as Hebrews tells us. He said it, and that should settle it completely in our minds. Now, saying that, I said that for a reason. Last week we looked at verses 1 and 2. And it talked about Peter stirring up the believers, stirring their pure minds to get back to the word of God, to get back to that fundamental relationship that they had with Jesus Christ. For you older believers, sometimes what happens is that we we get complacent, we get busy with the work, and we forget that we need to spend time with the Lord. We need to be in his word. We need to have a heart for God more than anything else, than a work for God but be in love with God. And so he's stirring their pure minds as a reminder of the words that were spoken by the Old Testament and the words and the commandments that were given by the apostles themselves from the Lord Jesus Christ. And so the word of God is important. And in these next few verses that we will be looking at this morning, the word of God will be attacked. Be attacked. This word is always attacked. People are always attacking the Word of God. You hear things like, oh, that's just a book written by men. Yeah, you're right. And so we really can't trust it. No, you're wrong. We can trust it. Because those men were moved by the Holy Spirit. Oh, now you're talking about, ooh, the Holy Spirit. You know, what does that mean, the Holy Spirit? Well, that's the Spirit of God. And if God sits upon the throne and He's in control of all things, He can lay in the hearts of men what to write down so that generations and generations will glean and learn and grow in getting to know and understand who Jesus Christ is. The problem is we don't get into the Word of God. We don't get into the Word of God. We're not reading on a daily basis. This is what Warren Wisby said. They want you, this is these these liars, these mockers, these scoffers that are lying about the word of God, he says, they want you to forget that the very word that they deride or they mock is in control of God's universe. God created everything by his word, and his word holds it together. His word caused the flood And his word will one day bring a judgment of fire to an ungodly world. That's the word of God. It is powerful. We can depend upon it. And even if others come along and mock it and laugh at it, without really any evidence whatsoever, just to laugh and mock and hopefully to persuade you to believe that it's just a bunch of crock, you know, you need to be aware of this because then they win. And they pull you away from the word of God. And so where is Jesus? That's my theme this morning. Where is Jesus? Now in the sense of he said he was coming back and yet he's not here. So where is he? So we see last day scoffers in verse 3. Knowing this first, let's read 3 through 4. Knowing this first, that scoffers will come in the last days walking according to their own lust, and saying, where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of creation, period. We'll get into five through seven next week. And so he says here, knowing this first, 
understanding, knowing this by experience, the situation that he's going to describe here in a minute. Last week we looked at the false teachers and how the false teachers came in with false doctrines to persuade the believers not to believe in the gospel message of Jesus Christ. So we know this. So knowing this first, that scoffers, these one translation says these mockers that make mockery. They are personally mockers, and they make mockery of things. You know these people. You have them in your workplaces. You might have them as neighbors or friends. And they're always mocking people. They're always laughing at people. Uh, there's really no intellectual reason for it. There's no evidence that is found in their reason. It's just a mockery. They just laugh at them and they make fun of them, hopefully that other people will join them and say, yeah, they are funny. Yeah, they are funny looking. Yeah, that is wrong. That's so silly. It's stupid. I don't believe in that type of stuff. And they just like to make mockeries of things. People have that personality of being a mocker and so they mock They scoff, is what Peter says here. And it says that they will come in the last days. Let's spend some time here. One of the first important signs of the last days is scoffers who question the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. These scoffers, during the time of Peter, are literally questioning the coming of Jesus Christ. We should know that this will and is normal for the church or Christian experience to experience scoffers. If you are a Christian, then you will have people in your life who will scoff or mock you for your Christianity. You have to understand that is normal. Don't get upset. Don't become fearful. Don't question whether Christianity is true or not. Understand that that comes with the territory. Being a Christian means people will mock you. They'll laugh at you. They'll ridicule you. As a church, the church in in, in fullness will be mocked at, will be ridiculed, will be questioned. And the reason for this is to draw attention to the flaws of the church so that others outside of the church won't believe or come to know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. One of the greatest plans of of Satan, and listen to me, One of the greatest plans of Satan is to divide the body of Christ. If he can divide us, then he can destroy us, but also destroy our witness to the world that's out there. And that's really what he wants to do, because that's a bigger picture. If you go to a church and it is divided, and there is mockery, and there's scoffing, and there's questioning, and there's doubting, Instead of what God wants to do, support, encourage, and strengthen, faithfulness, commitment, all those things, the enemy will take that church and others will come in and go, why do I want to be here? There's too many problems here. They're gone and they go somewhere else. A bigger church where they can hide, a smaller church where there's more control and people are excited, but they'll find somewhere else. The enemy has done a great job at that in these last days with the church itself. There's a lot of division. And when something big happens within the church, and I'm talking about uh, those pillars within the church community. In in Protestantism, you you have like the John MacArthur's, you have the the, the Chuck Smith's uh, who's now passed away. Uh, You have the Driscoll's. You You have these men that everybody, you know, they know of them. And then all of a sudden things happen in that arena then brings doubt to the rest of the world because then the mockers come and say, "Uh uh-huh, see, they can't even get along. Uh Uh-huh, see, they've got problems. Why would we want to be Christians? That's the whole problem. And that's sad. It's a ploy of the enemy. We as believers need to make a choice not to fall into that trap, not to give in to the enemy, but to be faithful to God, to be committed to God and let God handle everything else that is around us, even those mockers. So it is a normal part of our Christian faith. It is a part of the church that you will have these people. Be aware of this. Understand it. Don't let it persuade you. Don't let it weaken you. But let it strengthen you, if anything, because Peter said you will have scoffers in the last days. Be assured of that. Life is not easy. Uh, You know, I love new believers because they think everything is going to be all right. 
that, that life is going to be good from this point on because we come to Christ, you know, and we have this new faith and we're excited, you know, but it's not true. There are going to be trials, there are going to be temptations, there are going to be struggles. You will be, back, you will be stabbed in the back, you'll be stabbed in the front, right to your face. These are all things that we need to accept and be aware of and know that it should not sway us from our faith in Jesus Christ. See, what we're doing <clears throat> what we're doing is we're responding to the attacks of the enemy by saying we will not be moved, we will stand strong. But these scoffers, the reason that they do this is because they have uh, fallen from the faith or they have no faith whatsoever. As Paul said, the Spirit expressly says that in the latter times or the last days, some will depart from the faith, giving heed to deceiving spirits and doctrines of demons, speaking lies and hypocrisy, having their own conscience seared with a hot iron. Be careful of that. Now, when are these last days? What last days is he talking about here? Some say that when Jesus was born there in the manger, that began the last days. Some say it was at the ascension of Jesus Christ into heaven, and that began the last days. Peter writes in 2 Peter 1, 2, that Christ has appeared in the last days for the sake of you. So his appearance in the last days was done for you, for us, for the world. He gave his life. Hebrews amplifies this truth by instructing us that God in the last days has spoken to us through his son Jesus Christ, Hebrews 1 2. Peter referring to the beginning of the last days at Pentecost, you remember that story in Acts chapter 2, declaring that in the last days God will pour out his spirit upon all mankind. So you have various times where the word last days is used by the apostles. And so we are living in the last days. We are just closer to the last days than ever before. It's been 2,000 years, and we're that much closer. Interesting that Peter is dealing with this situation, and yet it's been only about 30 years, maybe even less than that. And these mockers and scoffers are there laughing and ridiculing. And Peter's having to encourage the church saying, we're in the last days. And that was 2,000 years ago. And I'm here to say, we're in the last days. Look at what's going on around this. And we're just that much closer to the return of Jesus Christ than ever before. And scoffers have and will continue to show up. See, scoffers have really no logical or sound argument against Christianity. They don't even know what Christianity stands for. And so when you hear them, you, you hear things like, oh, you guys talk about stoning people. I'm like, no, we don't. That's an Old Testament uh, system that God had implemented as a judicial system because there was no judicial system there. Today, what we do is we put them in prison, and in some cases, we will, we will sentence them to death. You know, that's basically what it is. But, oh, you're archaic because you stone people. See, they don't understand the scriptures. They only hear tidbits here and there, and they try to piece it together with their own understanding. And so their scoffing, their laughing, is hoping to get at those that are uneducated, those believers that are new to the faith, that don't really understand all these truths yet. And someone will come into their life, say, do you really believe that? Isn't that silly? Three persons and one God? That doesn't even make any sense. How funny is that? Well, it really isn't funny when you really think about the Trinity and how life itself has trinities. You have a body, you have a soul, and you have a spirit, the Trinity. You have a father, you have a mother, you have children, a Trinity. There are a lot of things in life that reveal trinities. And so why not God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, the Trinity? And yet people, because they don't understand it, because we're so finite in our thinking that we brush it aside as though it's not true, and the scoffers use this. And so again, do not let scoffers cripple your faith, but let it solidify the truth of the gospel that the end is even nearer than ever before. That's what it should do. We should be excited that the person is scoffing at us. And when they're scoffing at us, we probably should even respond, thank you so much for reminding me that the end is near. And they'll just laugh a little more and walk away because they have no answer to that. 
Spurgeon said, every time a blasphemer opens his mouth to deny the true revelation, he will help to confirm in us our conviction of the very truth which he denies. The Holy Ghost told us by the pen of Peter that it would be so, and now we see how truly he wrote. So scoffers will come in the last days. If anything, let the scoffers push you to find answers. They might have some great questions and they may be using these to scoff at us, but let it push you to find the answer to their questions. Let it push you to find the truth, but not discourage you. So these scoffers are walking according to their own flesh, Peter says in the next statement, their own flesh. The word walking is their action as a habitual lifestyle. This is how they live. They enjoy living like this. They will not give up living like this. It is who they are, and they will protect it at all costs, including lying and mocking and laughing at others so that they don't have to change their sinful lifestyle. People are that way. We rationalize things in our own minds so that we can continue to sin. Or we make up excuses so that we can continue to sin. Well, it's not my fault. It's the society's fault that I'm this way. Well, when you come to Christ, you are no longer that old creature. The Bible says you're a new creature in Christ Jesus, right? That old things have passed away. Behold, all things become new. And so your mind, your body, everything changes. And now you give in to the new man and you crucify the old man. And everything becomes new in Christ. And so you no longer blame others. You don't blame society. Now you say, I've got a choice. And I choose to walk righteously. I choose not to give in that way. I choose to be committed to my spouse. I choose to change in the way that I handle the situations with my children. I choose to be a committed man. I choose to be faithful. I choose to do these things because Christ is in me and greater is in me than he that is in this world. And if I can do anything, I can do all things through Christ Jesus who strengthens us. But these men love the flesh and to cater to the flesh. And so they will do whatever it takes to keep living this lifestyle according to their own flesh. And so they deny the lordship of God over their lives, right? Basically, that's what they're doing. They're basically saying, I don't need God telling me what to do. He's not my master. He's not my Lord. I'm in control of my own life and my own destiny. I will make my own decisions. That's not true of a believer. We've made the choice to receive Jesus as our Savior, but also our Lord. And we've made the choice now to say, I no longer run my life, you run my life. That's a, that's a big problem within the Christian church and with with a lot of Christians, is that we don't pray and seek God for advice on all of our decisions. We usually make them ourselves. And we need to include God in our decision making. He's our Lord. It's a wise thing to do when you really think about it. Because God knows all things beginning to end. He already knows what tomorrow brings. And so if he's in control of your life, then he will lead you and guide you on the right path. But if we're in control, then we will make decisions and plans that will lead us to destruction. It will lead us to follies. And that's foolishness. And yet we do it all the time. I'm amazed at how many people have made the wrong decisions in choosing their spouse. All because they have this passion and this connection and this love uh, for that person, uh, there's something about standing next to them. I just feel good. They make me happy. They put a smile on my face. But the whole time, they've never asked God if that's the person that he would want them to marry because he knows how they will be in the future. He knows their flaws in their very heart. And so we rather go on those feelings and those emotions and those sensations instead of saying, Lord, is this the person that you want me to spend the rest of my life with? And if the Lord says no, then willing to say, okay, I'm going to lay aside all my feelings and emotions and I'm going to move on. I'm going to wait for you to bring that person to me. 
No, too many times they go for their plan and then they're in counseling. And they're wondering, why did I do this? And he wasn't like this when we first met. You know, he's totally different now. He's changed or she's changed, you know. And this isn't what I signed up for. And now you begin to control your life again by saying, I'm going to separate, I'm going to leave, I'm going to, you know, do this, I'm going to do that. And, And God's still not, you haven't gotten it. You haven't gotten it. And that's why our lives are so messed up. Because we don't let God be our Lord. These men love the flesh. They love to lust after things. And they're going to live it without God. And so God, you're not my Lord. Remember that weak morals is a reflection of weak doctrine. Weak morals is a reflection of weak doctrine. So you need to be in the word of God. Adam Clark said the gospel of Jesus Christ is pure and holy. And requires a holy heart and holy life. They wish to follow their own lust and consequently cannot keep the truth of the gospel. The word is holy. It's pure. It's true. And if you follow it, you'll be blessed. But when you lust, you can't keep the holy gospel. If you believe that Jesus is not coming for the second time, then you will live without morals because you know that there's no consequences. And that's what these men were doing. These scoffers basically were saying, look, uh, there is no second coming. And since there's no second coming, there is no judgment. And since there's no judgment, guess what? We get to live the way we want to live. And so enjoy yourselves. Eat, drink, and be merry like the days of Noah. And they gave in marriage and so forth and had children. But then sudden destruction came. Timmy, Timothy uh, three one, Second Timothy 3.1 says this, Know this, that in the last days perilous times will come. For men will be lovers of themselves. Boy, is that true. Men are lovers of themselves. We should take this to heart, what what Timothy is saying, especially us as believers, and guard our hearts from this. We want to have a sensitive heart that we're humble before the Lord, not lovers of ourselves. A person that is a lover of self is only concerned about one person, self. Will that hurt me? that's not right for me I don't get that that's not fair those type of things are self love self love and those are signs of the last days lovers of money people will do whatever it takes for money I think of back in the early 70s, 80s, late 70s, 80s, I remember there was a a movie that was made, Chariots of Fire. And it was about a a runner who was a gold medalist. I think it was Germany, if I get it correctly, Chariots of Fire, and it was Germany. And they were going to host his meet, his running event on a Sunday morning. And he made a stand not to run because it was on the Sabbath day. The day that Jesus resurrected, it was a day of going to church and reflection and worshiping God. And it made the news all over the world. The Sabbath was a day for the Lord. And he didn't run because he had that conviction in his own heart. In fact, during those times in the 60s, uh, some of you might remember, I remember a little bit, Sundays usually uh, nothing was open. Stores were closed because it was the day to spend with your family and go to church. Chick-fil-A understood this. He, he doesn't open up on Sundays. You can't get Chick-fil-A on Sundays. But because of our culture, because of love of money, because of our society, people have left that conviction and realized we can work on Sunday. And make money on Sunday to pay our bills because we have material things that we'd like to have. Cars and games and vacations and rentals and various things like that. The love of money is a subtle thing. It is amazing. It will divide families. The love of money. When you're always thinking about those things, that's when you know you love money. Paul goes on and says, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, unloving, 
unforgiving, slanders, without self-control, brutal, despisers of good. And that was their lifestyle. And they loved living this way. And they would scoff. These scoffers lived a sinful lifestyle. And so in verse 4, they would say this. Where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of creation. In other words, they were saying continually. It was a continual belittling. It's what they really believed. Obviously, you don't see us coming, so you don't believe that he's coming. And it's been 30 years <laughs> since his ascension, his ascension. And so, I mean, it's a little late. No, here we are 2,000 years and he still hasn't come, so where is this coming? Where is he at? Is he ever coming? You know, and from a logical standpoint, you, you almost can understand that. It's been a long time. It's been a long time. And it makes sense, but yet, is the word true or is the word a lie? That's the question. The word is true, and it says that Jesus is going to return doesn't say when he's going to return it just says he will return and we have to believe that we're in the last days and he can return right now because nothing is holding it holding him back from returning there's no event the next thing to happen is the rapture and we're taken out of here as the church those who believe in him and so their question is where is jesus why hasn't he come back and you can almost see the smirk on their faces they're talking to peter and christians you know you say he's coming <laughs> where is he you know i don't see him Ooh, let's look around the corner you know is he in your building or something you know and, and yet isn't it funny that a lot of people at these last days are rising up i just saw a documentary and there were five uh important people that are that were saying they're jesus christ one guy's in a mental institution <clears throat> of course we saw the other guy several uh, a month ago or so on the on the uh, uh, viewer here and, and how he said he was jesus and jesus came to him to make him christ and there's others too and they're saying that they're jesus and they're the second coming and yet these men are saying that he's not here and when they say second coming they're talking about the the coming of his judgment day not the rapture and the context is clear because uh peter will later on talk about uh, the last days of the lord and, and some of the things that will take place during that time the judgment of god so these mockers are talking about the second coming not the rapture they're not concerned about the rapture you're concerned about the day that Jesus comes to judge the world, judge them for their sinful living and so forth. And yet he's not here. There are so many who deny the second coming of Jesus Christ. They don't believe that he's going to come again. There are even Christian organizations that deny it to a certain degree. I don't know if you've heard of the Kingdom Now theology. A lot of you probably have not. You probably don't even care. But the, the kingdom now theology is prevalent among the um, charismatic uh, Christian groups. And basically what kingdom now theology says, let, let me read it to you. Kingdom theology is a theology belief within the, the charismatic movement of Pentecostal Christianity, namely in the United States. Uh, kingdom now proponents believe that God lost control over the world to Satan when Adam and Eve sinned. Since then, the theology goes, God has been trying to reestablish control over the world by seeking a special group of believers known variously as covenant people. You may have heard that word, covenant people. Or overcomers, overcomers. Or Joel's army, I've heard that one before. I've heard overcomers on TBN. Usually you hear some of these things on TBN. We're overcomers, we're Joel's army. You know, we're covenant people. Well, these are all people that believe in kingdom now theology. That through these people, social institutions, including government and law, would be brought under God's authority. The belief is that since believers are indwelt by the same Holy Spirit that indwelt Jesus, we have all authority in heaven and on earth, and we have the power to believe for and speak into existence things that are not. And thus we can bring about the kingdom age. See, what they believe is, is that we have the power, just like Jesus, to speak things into existence. And so we need to take control of this world. 
because Satan has it. And we as Christians need to take it back. And so we need to control the churches. We need to control the cities. We need to control the states. We need to control the United States and the government. We need to control the world because we have that power. And so God wants control and he uses these specific people, these, these overcomers, these Joel's armies to do this in the name of Jesus. Now, is that going to happen? I don't see it happening right now. Are we as a church in control? I think the opposite. We have lost so much power. We have lost so much weight in our society. It's the opposite. Now, this is what they say. The kingdom now theology sees the second coming of Jesus Christ in two stages. First, through the flesh of the believers, and in particular, the flesh of today's apostles and prophets. And then in person to, the, to take over the kingdom handed to him by those who have been victorious, that is the overcomers, prior to the second coming. Overcomers must purge the earth of all evil influences. Kingdom now claims that Jesus cannot return until all his enemies have been put under his feet, of the, have been put under the feet of the church, including death, presumptuously. And so what they're saying is, Jesus isn't returning until we take control. Until we as overcomers and believers take control of the world. And we need to take control of this world by force. And so these groups are trying to take control of the world, take control of the moral values and so forth of the world so that they can then come to God, again, their works, their righteousness, what they have done by overcoming and say, Jesus, here's the world. We've made it pure for you. Now you can receive it. And that's not what the Bible teaches. And so in a sense, they're denying the second coming of Christ because it won't happen until this world is pure and holy. That's false, by the way, just to make that clear. Again, this is false. We don't believe that. Nothing is holding Jesus from coming back again. The rapture will take place. Seven years later, Jesus will come and destroy and judge the world. And then he will set up his millennium. We as believers in Jesus Christ will be used as instruments of righteousness. We will be the ones leading and guiding the people during that time that have went through the tribulation period or that are in heaven because of the tribulation period and the rest of the world. But Jesus will come on his time, in his righteousness, and in his work. Not our work at all. Not our work at all. Scoffers. They say, for since the fathers fell asleep, not, not sleeping, but death itself, all things continue as they were from the beginning of creation. Now, what I find interesting about this whole opposition of Christianity uh, thing is that Christianity is still going on. <laughs> you, you would think, right? You would, you would think that if this was true, you know, that Jesus wasn't coming back and that Christianity was a fake and just another you would think that by now it would have died off it would have died off with all the accusations there are few faiths that have died off I'm sorry the opposite there are many faiths that have died off except for Christianity when you really trace back a lot of these religions you know let's take Jehovah Witnesses for instance the beginning of Jehovah Witness was in the 1800s so they're they're barely around they were barely around. Uh, same with Mormonism. Same with some of the cults. Catholicism wasn't until hundreds of years after uh, Jesus' ascension and resurrection. Resurrection ascension. Hundreds of years after. The only other faith was possibly some of the Asian faiths. Buddhism, Islam, Muhammad and so forth was before Christ and during that time of Christ. But you see the heirs in those things. They're not Christian faiths. They're cultic faiths. Uh, They believe in the occult, though they try to tie themselves to Christianity like Abraham and and so forth with uh, Muslims and Islam and and so forth, things like that. But you you do some research on Buddhism, uh, not Muhammad, but Buddha, and you trace back where he came from as a little boy and what his father taught him uh, there in... uh, um, where he grew up, you find that um, they were losing 
they were losing strength in their system with the people because it really brought no hope to them. And so what they did was there were missionaries that went over there and began to witness to them and they saw the power in the witnessing of the gospel message in Jesus Christ so they started to incorporate some of the Christian faith into their system so that uh, people would see some hope in their Buddhist faith. And that's what helped them survive when you trace it all back. No, it's, it's Christianity that goes all the way back to Genesis. God walked with man. He created man. Jesus came and he walked with us and created a relationship with us and it continues on to this day. It will not fade away. You know, they believe, these men believe, these scoffers believe that life hasn't changed, nothing's changed. You know, a man is born, a man lives, a man dies. You know, in between that, you know, do whatever you can to enjoy life. But after that, there's, there's no more to it. I mean, what kind of life is that? What kind of hope is that? That is so far from the truth. I mean, it is amazing how much evidence we have today, but the reality is, is that men want to live a sinful life, and so they will not believe, or they will not accept the truth as, as its evidence. Evolution, the biggest lie ever. And yet, we have many scientists biologists especially, who view the body and the universe and they realize there's got to be intelligent design. Everything about the body shows that there was a designer because there's mapping. There's design to the work. It can't just evolve in that type of situation. And because of intelligent design, we know that evolution is wrong. There's a big gap theory. There's a transition that's missing, and it's still missing to this day. You don't have it. You have forms of what we call macro or micro evolution within the species. You have dogs, and you have all kinds of dogs, but there's still a dog. I've never seen a dog with a horse's head, have you? You, know, you just won't get that. <clears throat> or a lion you know, with a poodle's uh, but behind him, you know, you don't, you don't get that, you know, but you see cats and you see cats from one end all the way to lions to the other end. And those are micro and macro evolutions. But there is no transition from one species to another. You don't find that anywhere. Now, their, their whole answer to that is giving time. We need to just give it more time. Well, guess what? The more time that that they have been given, the more they find that it's not true. The more fossil records prove it's not true. Fossil records that show dinosaurs with men, the footsteps walking right next to the dinosaur with one another. Amazing stuff. This is stuff they don't tell you about in school because they don't want you to believe in Jesus Christ. They don't want you to believe in creationism. They want you to believe in the lie. Because then if you believe in the lie, then you're going to live the way uh, of your moral values. See, evolution teaches that we all evolved. And really, we're part of the animal structure and system. And so we're really animals. And so if you want to live a certain way, hey, that's, that's your right. So live that way. You're an animal. If you want to be a prowler, then be a prowler. And you can prowl all your life because eventually one day you're going to die. So you might as well prowl right now while you have the chance. And that's a lie of the enemy. That's what these scoffers believe. But we know that, that in life there's purpose, that God has a purpose for us. And that purpose is what? To glorify God. Uh, 1 Corinthians 10.31, whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. Do all to the glory of God. That's the chief end of man, is to glorify God. Whatever it is. Oh yeah, we try to figure out, well, what's my purpose? What's the, what's the plan for my life? And, and you still might be trying to figure that out. But whatever you're doing now, you glorify God in it. You be faithful and committed to Him and the things that He has given unto you to do at this time. Understand that. It's about faithfulness and glorifying God in humility. Let's close. Let me sum it up by the words of John Corson. He said, the root of skepticism 
and cynicism, cynicalism, lies in a desire to follow one's flesh and fulfill one's lust. A denial of the return of Jesus allows people to live however they want because it removes accountability to God who made them and who will return for them.